Thank you, Carol, and thank you to the other organizers for putting a great meeting together. I'm very happy to be here. So I'm going to continue on the theme of uh, free probability, um, but going in a little bit direction, different direction than what Roland was talking about, and, and uh, exploring what uh, transposes can do for you in freeness. So earlier this week, we saw in several talks how in uh, quantum information theory, some uh, channels are constructed using transposes and partial transposes. And uh, so they, it turns out they also play a role in freeness. The same construction give, can produce freeness. So uh, I think the part of the purpose of my, um, from my point of view of the talk is just to advertise how freeness can come into it and hope that uh, some people in quantum information theory will figure out some way to use that. So we saw from uh, Roland's talk that when you have some operators that are free, there's rules for computing distributions. But you, you can't use those rules unless you know that you have freeness. So um, <coughs> uh, my contribution is going to be to show that in certain cases you do have freeness and therefore the, all the rules of uh, free probability can be applied to do calculations. So let's just get started here. So I'm going to talk about uh, what are called free cumulants. And uh, so I don't think anyone's mentioned the word cumulant yet this week, so I thought I'd better say something about what a cumulant is because the whole talk is going to hinge on cumulants. So up there I just put what I call tensor or classical cumulants. So those are the, you take a distribution on the real line you take its uh, Fourier transform, you take the logarithm, you expand that as an exponential generating function and the coefficients you call the classical or tensor cumulants of the uh, distribution. But you can make them linear functionals and uh, the, uh, the crucial rule for all of these things is this little formula down here at the bottom that I've put in the box that says an expectation of any product, whatever the random variables are, can be expressed in terms of cumulants. And I've, so you put this subscript pi to indicate that you uh, group the random variables together in blocks. And I just put some examples. So maybe we just look at this one. So this says you have three arguments and you have one block with the first element and another block with elements two and three. So you, you put the x1 on its own and since there's only one element there, you take a k1 and the other two elements uh, there are two of them, so you put a K2. And uh, using this formula down in the box, the, the expectation of three things can be written as this sum with five terms because there's five partitions of three elements. So uh, this formula can be used to inductively, recursively define all the cumulants. Um, so when you start off with n equals 1 and that tells you what k1 is, when you, then you go n equals 2, there's two terms, one of them you already know, so you can solve uh, for the one you don't know. And the crucial thing is that the one, uh, let's see, okay, I don't know if anybody can see, the one you don't know is always appears as a linear term. So sometimes you have products, so you might have to solve there, you might have to, that's k1 cubed but here it's always k3 to the first power, so you can always solve a system. So it's a nonlinear system of equations, but it's always linear in the thing that you don't know, so you can always solve it. So uh, here's the version of free cumulants. This is uh, Roland's work from about 25 years ago, that the, in free probability, the, the coefficients of the R transform that Wojcielewski came up with have a, a very similar expansion, except instead of doing all partitions, you do non-crossing partitions. So uh, it's a little hard, I haven't shown you anything here because uh, in the case of four, there's uh, 15 partitions of four elements and one of them has a crossing. And there's 14 of them non-crossing, and so you wouldn't even know that, the, that, the, that I've taken one term out there, but I have. So they, there's, one, there's one pairing that has a crossing, and that's gone, and all the other ones are, are there. So uh, this is, for free probability, this is the fundamental rule, that uh, 
you write the expectation of a product as a sum of uh, free cumulants. So I'm going to use the notation uh, kappa for the free cumulants and k for the tensor cumulants. Okay, so <coughs> uh, let me just review a couple of points about uh, freeness and how do you use uh, free cumulants to detect freeness. So the, the, the general setup, okay, so yeah, we start at the very top here. We start with some algebra, which has a unit, and a linear functional, which uh, often is a trace, but it doesn't have to be at this stage. But the thing that you want is that the, uh, it takes the identity of the algebra to the, the scalar one. And this is Wojcolescu's original definition of freeness which, as Roland was telling us, was modeled on uh, free group von Neumann algebras. So uh, you have some subalgebras of an algebra and you say they're freely independent with respect to this uh, state. If whenever you take some elements in the subalgebra and that are centered and they, each element comes from one of this, these subalgebras, but adjacent elements always come from different subalgebras, then the product is centered. So uh, you can, if you look at uh, the Cayley graph of the free group, you can interpret this as, a, as paths that's on the, on the Cayley graph that essentially says the only way you can get back to your starting point is by backtracking. And, uh, but if whenever you go from one element to another, you can't undo what you did in the previous thing because uh, those are different generators. So you, there's a way of interpreting this just on, on a tree, as a path on a tree. And we say random variables are free if the unital subalgebras they generate are free. And now the, the thing we're going to use is this thing about uh, mixed cumulants. So in tensor random variables, there was a theorem that said random variables are tensor independent if their mixed cumulants vanish. And uh, for for many calculations, this is the easiest way to prove that things are independent, is to, is, is to show that mixed cumulants are zero. And um, so we were talking a little bit in the previous talk about how do you do things, well, so the R transform method uh, that isn't so useful for those calculations that Roland was doing, but uh, is, is that if elements are free, then the cumulant of the sum is just the sum of the cumulants. And um, so if you want to do those uh, polynomials or rational functions in semicircular operators, or that, that's hard, you can't do those distribution calculations like this. But for simple things, um, that's a good rule for, for computing uh, the distribution. Okay, so I think we've seen the semicircular operator many times. The crucial thing about that is that all the cumulants are zero except the second one. And the other distribution that I'm going to talk about is Marchenko-Pasteur. And it also has a simple description in terms of cumulants, that all the cumulants are equal to this parameter C that comes up in the limiting distribution. So uh, these two distributions, which are very useful in uh, random matrix theory, all are also special because their cumulants are so simple. And uh, that's, that makes them good for calculations. Okay, so uh, I mean just so I'm going to talk about uh, Wishart matrices. So this means you take a, you start with a, a matrix G, which is rectangular, and I'm just going to talk about Gaussian ones. So there'll be n zero one random variables, and uh, I just mention a little flag here that in free probability the tendency is to normalize it differently than is done in physics or statistics or engineering. So everybody else does it this way down here. Uh, they divide by M. And in free probability, you want to divide by N. So it's a small shift, but it actually it just saves you some confusing calculations at some point. So if you know of one, you can always do the other, but it's just, just in case anybody's checking formulas, I'll do it slightly differently. So what I want to talk about are uh, block uh, Wishart random matrices. So we just take our, our 
our G and we chop it up into some blocks. And uh, then we, we just interpret this as a, as a matrix whose entries, whose entries are other matrices. So I'm going to always think of uh, uh, D1 blocks, and inside each block it'll be a D2 by D2 uh, matrix. OK, so uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about partial transposes mostly. So there's two things you could do. You could either transpose the blocks, but nothing inside a block. So I'm going to call that a left partial transpose. Or you could leave the blocks in place and just transpose the entries inside each block. And I'm going to call that a right partial transpose. So left and right are somewhat arbitrary, but the important thing is you just be consistent. OK. So in order to get a limit, we always assume Somehow I can never see that uh, this ratio, this is the uh, number of rows divided by the number of columns. So I said number of uh, number of columns divided by the number of rows converges to some parameter. So we'll always be doing that throughout the, the, the discussion. Of course, it's only that the product d1 and d2 go to infinity that counts. So Sometimes I'm going to have both the number of blocks and the size of the block going to infinity. But so you can also fix the number of blocks and just let the size of the blocks go to infinity. So you can, you can do it two different ways. And you're going to get different things. So uh, if you transpose uh, a Wishart matrix, you get another Wishart matrix. So you always get a Marchenko-Pasteur limit distribution. And then Five or so years ago, Guillaume Brun showed something I think which was pretty surprising to me and maybe lots of other people that when you partially transpose um, a Wishart matrix, uh, you kill all the higher cumulants. So the first two cumulants, kappa one and kappa two, stay the same as, as, as for a Marchenko Pasteur, but you kill all the higher ones, kappa three and so on. And the only distribution, as we saw, that has uh, uh, the first two cumulants different from zero has a, is a semicircle. So we have mean C and variance C. And um, so just to show you the, uh, the, how the cumulant method works, I'm just going to go back and look at Guillaume's calculation, doing it in completely different notation so it may not be recognizable. Um, so uh, here we go. So you, you, because we're taking Gaussian random variables, I can start with my Wishart matrix, take its partial transpose, raise it to a power, and I can integrate everything out and get a, using Wick, the Wick formula, and get a, a sum over the permutation group. And I group things together in a nice way, so I'm going to take P over D1 times D2 because that's converging to my parameter C, and then I'm going to get some power of D1 and some power of D2. And again, doing some uh, calculating uh, with, with the Wick formula, you can find simple expressions. So uh, you, you take these permutations and you multiply it by this permutation that has one cycle. And uh, I always call it gamma because the first time I saw this was back in Boykolescu's 1991 paper where he showed that independent um, GUE random matrices were asymptotically free, so it's always been gamma in my, uh, in my notation. So uh, you count the number of cycles. Well, let, let's look at sigma 2. So uh, F2 of sigma, you count the number of cycles in sigma, and then that's the number of cycles in the Kreveras complement of sigma. And uh, you add them and subtract n plus 1, and you can do this a couple of ways. So if, uh, it comes down to Euler's formula for the genus of a certain surface, or uh, Philippe Bion showed uh, 20 some years ago that uh, you can describe the non crossing partitions inside the symmetric group by a metric relation. So, a certain, you can define a distance function. I didn't use that notation here, but this is completely equivalent to what Philippe did in his paper. And so, uh, in, in, the, in the model that Guillaume was using, both D1 and D2 are going to infinity. 
And these exponents are either zero or negative. So if the exponent is negative, the, that's going to kill that, the term corresponding to that. Oops, that should have been a sigma there, that subscript, sorry. Um, <coughs> that will kill that term. So we just look for the sigmas for which both exponents are zero. And that means both sigma and its inverse have to satisfy this uh, metric condition. And this one would say that sigma is a non-crossing partition, and this one says that sigma inverse is a non-crossing partition. So I'll just try and I'll explain on the next slide what that means, but for the moment let's just I'll leave that hanging. So then we can we can write down our limit, and we're oops, I meant same typo again, that should have been a sigma. Um, so this uh, big expression here, this ratio converges to C. And I throw away, that should have been a, uh, okay, sorry for the confusion, anyway, that should have been a sigma or that should have been a pi, I can't, should have made up my mind, but anyway, I throw away all the partitions that have blocks or cycles with three or more elements in it. And now I could just interpret this back in, t in, in terms of that formula where I said moments are a sum of cumulants. So whatever these things are, they have to be cumulants. And this says that only blocks of size one or two survive. So that means only the first and second cumulant are non-zero. So that means you get a semicircular operator. So uh, um, this is a known result, but do you see how the cumulant method can, once you know what to look for, will get you there fairly quickly. Okay, now let me just explain on the next slide what I meant here by saying both sigma and sigma inverse are non-crossing. So sigma is a permutation. So I'm going to, uh, let's say I just take 1, 3, 4 as one cycle and 2 and 5. Somehow I can never see this thing. Okay, here we go. And I just draw them around a circle. And there's sigma inverse. And the only difference is the order you go around that cycle. Now, if you just look at the left-hand column, they both appear to be non-crossing. So what do I mean by saying that one of them has a crossing and the other one doesn't? Well, you do this little trick uh, where you, you take every number and you split it. You do a 1, a minus 1, a 2, a minus 2, and you say that I leave on a negative number and I arrive on a positive number. So if I start, if I go from 1 to 3, then I put a line in from minus 1 to plus 3. Okay, so I, I convert the diagram on the left to the one on the right by just splitting every, every vertex into two pieces. But when I go around in the wrong direction over here, I produce crossings. So I'm going to say that this other sigma, maybe I should have called it sigma uh, prime, it's a different sigma, this one has a crossing, but the other one doesn't, even though when you draw the cycles, they don't cross, so it's a small twisting of the usual convention. Um, and the, it's pretty easy to just to see from this picture that if, if, uh, if you ever have a cycle of length three or more in your permutation, you're always going to produce crossings if you go around it in both, one of them, one direction will always produce crossings. So the cycle just crosses itself. So it's, you don't even have to interact with another cycle. <laughs> um, so the, the conclusion is that when you go back to, uh, to this formula over here, I only get permutations that have cycles of length one or two, and that means only kappa one and kappa two are different from zero. Everything else is, is uh, zero, and therefore I only get a semicircular operator. Okay. So uh, there's a little bit of a uh, summarize about where, I'm not going to say too much about this today, but uh, uh, the first time I saw uh, Freenus, or transpose coming up in, uh, in uh, Freenus was in second order Freenus, and as Emily Rettelmeyer in her PhD thesis had something called real second order Freenus, where you had to have a distribution, you had to have an algebra where you also had to throw in transposes. So uh, in your uh, non-commutative uh, random variables had to have transposes in order to capture all the terms that you needed. Um, 
Then um, Mihai Popa and I looked at uh, um, orthogonally invariant distributions and looked at their second order things and we saw that you needed, to, okay, we could really got into the transposes pretty heavily there and while doing that we found that uh, you had, if you had uh, unitarily invariant random matrices, they were both real and complex second order free. So there were two formulas that had to be true at the same time, but the formulas were different. And the only way that could happen is some of the terms were zero. And by investigating what, what that meant for those terms to be zero, it was clear that you could have a matrix that was free from its transpose. And uh, so then we, try, then we realized that if any unitarily invariant matrix is free from its transpose. Um, and uh, so that sort of said, okay, freeness is going to be, a trans, uh, transposing will produce freeness in lots of situations. So uh, in the paper I mentioned at the beginning, well, I think I forgot to mention, I didn't mention it, but this paper we put on the archive in June, um, in the regime where both the number of blocks and the size of the blocks go to infinity, when you start with a Wishart matrix, all four things become asymptotically free. So you get four different self-adjoint operators and uh, so the first and the last are Marchenko Pasteur and the middle two are semicircles, but they're all free. So um, even partial transposing makes an operator free. Um, and you can do the same thing with Haar unitaries in the same regime. You um, number of blocks and the size of the blocks go to infinity, um, partial transpose for Haar unitaries. And it seems there's probably a very general theorem, which I don't know the statement of, that says this is, is going to happen quite often. Okay, so uh, there's another regime that I want to look at. So I'm calling that the Banika and Nikita regime because I learned about it from their paper. Uh, in this case, you fix the number of blocks and you let the size of the blocks go to infinity. <coughs> so everything, the setup is the same, but now um, D1 is constant. Okay, well, uh, you look at the original Wishart matrix it's going to converge to a Marchenko Pasteur or just as before. It's the size of the matrix is going to infinity. Nothing changes there. But when you look at the partial transpose, okay, you, you get an operator which is not a semicircular and it's not a Marchenko Pasteur. So their paper was asking, what is it? And <coughs> I didn't realize until a few days ago that it had a name. It seems the name is a subtracted Marchenko Pasteur. <laughs> okay, that's a good name for it. And uh, what they showed in their paper is you can, you can com com uh, compute the cumulants of this thing and you just get uh, two numbers. Now I have a feeling these are completely different numbers than they had in their paper because I think they're using the physicist normalization and I'm using the free probabilist normalization. So there's a lot of uh, annoying calculations to convert one uh, system of units to another system of units, but anyway, I, I, for from a free probabilist point of view, these are the right, this is the right units because the numbers are simple. And uh, so what they showed is that, of course, you can, you can write this fact as, uh, by just writing the cumulants as a sum of two things and one of them has a minus one to the r in it, so that means you've multiplied an operator by minus one because the cumulants are, 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 are multilinear, so if you multiply the cumulant of minus, the rth cumulant of minus x is minus one to the r times the rth cumulant of x. And um, so what I want to look at today is just another way of understanding this uh, subtracted Marchenko Pasteur. So I just wrote down what, what this looks like in the uh, three by three case. So, so you have to, you have to put this D1 in here. You have to multiply this operator by D1. So little w means what happens in the limit. And you put this in here because it makes all the formulas come out nice. So you, instead of looking at w left transpose, you look at D1 and then the formulas are cleaner. Okay, and so there's uh, the case when D1 equals three. And you just transpose, so W21 
moves up to the 1, 2 entry. Okay, so uh, that's the matrix. Now, uh, these, yeah, so let me just say, these kinds of matrices were actually studied, uh, well, 15, 20 years ago by uh, Andrew Nika, Dimash Laktenko, and Roland in the context of uh, uh, something they called R-diagonal and R-cyclic operators. So actually, there's, there's three papers there. I'm just smearing them all together. So let me just tell you uh, what, uh, what those things are. So <coughs> we're in the context of a non-commutative probability space. And we, we make this little notation that if I raise an operator to the power of minus one, I mean take its adjoint. So, uh, and if I raise it to the power of one, I mean don't do anything to it at all. And we say that an operator is R diagonal if when you compute these cumulants, uh, so I, I have some of them have stars and some of them don't, that I get zero unless there's n, 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 or t an even number of a's, and the stars alternate. You either start on a star and go to an unstar, or the other way around. And if an operator satisfies that, you say it's R diagonal. If you have a matrix of operators, you say it's R cyclic. If whenever you take a cumulant like this of entries, that the second entry of uh, um, say a slot is equal to the first entry of the following one. So it's like if you're multiplying matrix elements. You would have J1 equals I2, J2 equals I3, and finally JR equals I1. So uh, you say a collection of operators is R cyclic because it's sort of sitting inside a, a matrix. Um, if um, all, almost all cumulants are zero except for some very special ones. So and you can see there's a, a general theme that nice operators are ones that have lots of zero cumulants. Um, or they're all the same, like a Marchenko Pasteur. But, uh, so from the point of view of free probability, the nice operators are the ones where the cumulants are simple to describe. So uh, if you have a self-adjoint element, you say it's even if all of its uh, odd moments are zero, just like in classical distributions. And if all the odd moments are zero, that's equivalent to saying all the odd cumulants are zero. And uh, there's a simple connection, is that if you start with an R diagonal operator and you put A on, on the uh, one, two entry and A star on the two, one entry, you get an even operator. And of course, it's going to be R cyclic. That's kind of trivial. But so there's a relation between even elements and R diagonal elements. So you can sort of move back and forth between the two by going to matrices. Okay, so let's just go back to the context of Wishart matrices. So uh, there's our, our, our two matrices. And uh, so what, uh, yeah. so these, these matrices have a limiting distribution, which is given by these four operators. So you can, they, uh, because they're free, they have a limit distribution. So um, you can, this is now in the uh, context where the, uh, the number of blocks is fixed. And so you don't get that they're all free, but you get that these two, this group is free from that group. And you can work out what the distribution between W and W partial transpose is. But uh, I'm just going to talk about the W partial transpose here. So W and the full transpose, they're going to be R cyclic. And these partial transposes, well, this is just supposed to be a joke. Um, uh, so a, a negative reflected R cyclic means it's the transpose of an R cyclic. That's a definition. <laughs> okay. Um, and um, so, so the, just finally getting to the, the main point of my talk. So I'm going to just look today about the t at the case when you have two blocks. So. Um, when you have two blocks, there's, there's our W again. And, and uh, those, uh, one way to realize this is that you, uh, you have a Marchenko Pasteur inside an algebra where you have some matrix units which are free from the Marchenko Pasteur. So 
there's many ways of realizing this, but you can just start, with, forget about the uh, random matrix construction and just go, assume you have an algebra with uh, matrix units and a Marchenko Pasteur, which is free, and in that paper I mentioned earlier of uh, Nika Speicher and Schlag Penko, um, you get an R cyclic, th that, that means the entries of that matrix W are, are cyclic. Okay, so uh, we, we're gonna just gonna work on this uh, matrix version of our picture. And we take our partially transposed Marchenko Pasteur, our subtractive, subtracted Marchenko Pasteur, and I'm just gonna write it as uh, the diagonal part and the off-diagonal part. Okay. <laughs> And the point here is that it's actually quite easy to see what the cumulants of these two operators are. This is another Marchenko Pasteur. This is an R diagonal operator. And uh, they both have the same, uh, I mean, th this one, let's see, this, actually this is an even operator, excuse me, this is an even operator, this is a positive operator. The, uh, the, the even cumulants of both of these operators are the same. The odd cumulants of x2 are zero. All the cumulants of x1 are just equal to two times c. So uh, this, this says that in the even case, you get two c plus two c, so you get the same formula that uh, uh, in the uh, Benika Nikita paper, you get four c, I mean again, this is using different scales here, but it's the same answer. And then in the odd case, you only get x1 contributing. So this is another way of, of course, you don't know that the cumulant of the sum is the sum of the cumulants unless you know that x1 and x2 are free. So um, this is kind of a backwards calculation in the sense that uh, usually you, you, well, you, you prove freeness in order to compute the, um, the, uh, the cumulants. Well, we already know the cumulants. Now what I want to do is, uh, they, they behave like they're free, and the question was, are they really free? And, okay, the answer is yes, and that's really the last part of my talk. So, uh, in, the, uh, in the subtracted version uh, of the Marchenko Pasteur, well, you, you just said, I can write those cumulants as a difference of some other cumulants, but there's actually no operators there. That's only at the level of distributions, and I don't know of any use of this thing I'm gonna prove in quantum information theory, but there is a concrete de decomposition that comes directly from the matrices, and you don't, you don't just have to say it's a difference of two things. And so the, what I'm claiming is that this X1 and X2 are free. And so you just decompose your matrix into some natural pieces and, and, you get the, and they're, they're free. So um, I should mention that if you uh, don't take the partial transpose, then they're not free, right? So it's only by switching the, di the off-diagonal entries that you get freeness. So x1 and x2 transpose are not free. There's a relation between them. But x1 and x2 are free. So that's the, <laughs> that's the, nub, of the, that's the nub of the theorem. <laughs> Okay, so I'm just repeating here what I said before, that uh, in the even case, I don't know why I can't see this, in the even case, you get contributions from both terms, and the odd case, you only get one of them. Okay, so uh, let's just see how you prove this. So this is gonna be a, an exercise in the vanishing of mixed cumulants. So in order to show that X1 and X2 are free, I'm going to compute all, I'm gonna show that uh, certain cumulants are always zero. And then by the general theory, uh, uh, Roland's theory of free cumulants, that will force them to be free. Okay, so the, uh, there's our moment cumulant formula, way back at the top there. And there's our operators. Okay, and I'm gonna, I don't know if this is really necessary, but this is how I did the calculation. I wrote x2 as the product of a diagonal operator plus an operator with just uh, ones and zeros. And that seemed to make calculations easier, but probably you, couldn't get it, you don't need that. So the, the challenge 
is to show that if I take any string, I1, I2, up to In, and take the cumulant, I'll get zero unless all the i's are the same. So unless they're all ones or all twos, I, I claim I'm going to get zero. So if there's one, one of them is a one and, the, and another one is a two, then that's enough to kill the whole thing. Now what, what do we have to work with? Well, we know that we started with a self-adjoint matrix. W is a self-adjoint matrix, so W i j star is W j i. And we know that the entries of W are, are cyclic. So that's going to put a ton of restrictions on those cumulants. And the, 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 the challenge is to turn this equation here about the cumulants of the entries into a statement about the cumulants of the matrices. So uh, then there's it's just some bookkeeping now to, to show that this, this thing here will force that thing up there. So we take three matrices. W1 is what I was calling X1. W2 is going to be uh, the just diagonal part, this uh, uh, X2 but moved over to the diagonal, and Y3 is this <coughs> flip matrix. So if I take any word in the X's, I can write it as a word in the Y's. Of course, I'm going to have some extra terms or extra letters because every, every uh, X2 is going to be turned into a Y2 times a Y3. So in order to compute this cumulant of the X's, I'm going to say I'm going to, that's the same, I'm going to reduce it to com uh, computing cumulants of the Y's. Now fortunately, there's a formula, also a formula of uh, Roland, about cumulants with products as entries. So these, uh, these cumulants here, some of those X's are X2's, which is a, a, a y2 times a y3. So there's actually a formula for computing, um, so I'm just going to have to point, computing a cumulant like this in terms of cumulants like that. So you need a little bit more, and I'll just put that on the next slide. Okay. So uh, let's just review a little bit of notation. So this is something I said way back at the beginning. If I have a partition and some elements, I can take its kappa pi, and that means for each block of pi, I have the elements, say there's m of them, I take the nth cumulant of those enter and write them in the same order. Okay, and there's just another example. So I did some more previously, that's just another example. Now, so here's this formula of Rollins that I mentioned. So this says that uh, I can write this cumulant of the X's in terms of cumulants of Y's, but I have to sum now over a whole bunch of partitions. And I have, so I, I, I have partitions such that whenever I take the soup of pi with this special partition row, I get a partition with one block. So that's quite a restrictive uh, assumption. What, it, what it's going to tell us is that every block of pi that satisfies that must contain um, either a, if it contains a Y1, it must contain either a Y2 or a Y3. And, and what is this row? Row is just uh, the partition where you have two adjacent elements if whenever you had a, uh, a Y2 followed by a Y3, and whenever you have a Y1, you just have a, a, a singleton. Okay, so there's just, a, here's the last little bit, so my time is almost up. There's just a little bit of logic in order to do this. So the, the main tool is this, so that you look at this Y3, you know that the trace of an odd power is zero because there's going to be zeros in the diagonal. So uh, if I take one of these cumulants and then the block of pi has an odd number uh, of y's in it, I'm going to get an off-diagonal thing that's going to kill the cumulant right there. So I only need to look at blocks that have an even number of y's. Okay. Now I use the R-cyclicity. So, so uh, as you multiply them along, so if I multiply these guys together, so you see, look, I can, I can have a y2 followed by a y1 because this ends with a 1 and that starts with a 1. So as long as you maintain that chain, 
you don't you uh, you won't get zero. But if you ever break it, then then you're going to be in trouble. So a y two can be followed by as many y ones as you want, but you can't go back to uh, a y two again until you do a flip. That that switches the indices around. So you have to have a y three before you can get back to a y two. So what that forces is that uh, the number of y3s between y2s has to be odd. And then you can show that in any block the number of y2s and the number of y3s has to be the same. In fact, has to be even. And so uh, that's going to force that condition. And let's just see in the next picture uh, why this thing is forced by that condition. So we said that a y1 has to be followed by a y3. But in here, there's some more blocks of pi. And in every block of pi, the number of y2s must equal the number of y3s. But right before this y3 over here was a y2. So that forces one too many y2s. So there are no solutions. So the cumulant is zero. <laughs> okay. Don't have to understand all the details right now. It's in the paper. <laughs> okay. So that means that uh, x1 and x2 are, are free, as, as we claim. Now, um, I only did this in the 2 by 2 case. I'm almost certain, but I, haven't, I can't write it down at the moment, that it works in general. Because, uh, I mean, this proof won't work, because uh, there's too many things going on. But what, would the, what you would do in the general case, let's go back, is you would take the diagonal, you take the super diagonal, the super super diagonal, and you decompose the matrix as a sum of pieces. And when you compute the cumulants, it all works. You get the right formula. So that doesn't prove that they're free, but um, it looks like you can decompose um, and probably lots of other cases. This is just the, the first example where you, it's simple enough you can work out. And once you get some examples, probably be, you can find lots more examples where you can decompose this. Okay, so. Um, I guess the, whoops, I got a little ahead of myself. Uh, so, the, um, so the conclusion is that the subtracted marchenko pasteur also has an, has an operator decomposition, which is, comes directly from the operators. And there's the paper I mentioned where we have all the details. And I'll put in a little plug. Um, so Roland and I just finished the book. And all kinds of other details and free probability are, are in our book. So that's my time, so. <laughs> <laughs>